And uh, here we go. While humans may have evolved out of caves and given up hunting and gathering in favor of skinny lattes at the mall, one thing remains as inescapable part of being an animal, and that is the act of defecation. Despite its importance, poop is a avo topic avoided in polite conversation. Funny that. It does not get the coverage it deserves in biology classes. Poop is not just waste. Animals and humans use poop in a variety of fascinating ways. Beth Baker has completed the Certified Interpretive Guide Training of the National Association of Inter Interpretation. She is a certified Alaska Master Naturalist, having completed the UAF Co Cooperation Extensive Program. She has also completed the Interpretive Natural Certification Program of Alaska and the Nat Alaska Naturalist Online Program through University of Alaska in Sitka. She is a volunteer naturalist at the Eagle River Visitor Center, where she has won the Volunteer of the Year Award. She is currently president of the Alaska Native Plant Society. She has completed the Ethnobotany Project Program from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And uh, here's our speaker, Beth Baker. That advances, that goes back, and I'll set you up. Good. Well, thanks for that nice introduction. I've got a little bit of virus, uh, but Friday I couldn't talk at all, so I'm glad that I can talk some, so hopefully my voice will last through this. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, as you said, uh, plants uh, you know, make their own food. Fungi absorb food, but all animals ingest food and excrete poop. The quote that he just had is, while humans may have evolved out of caves and given up hunting and gathering in favor of skinny lattes at the mall, one thing remains an inescapable part of being an animal, and that is the act of defecation. Just as the need to breathe and the need to food unites us, so does the need to poop. Yet, it remains a very neglected topic. <laughs> My interest in many things in life, you don't remember when you really developed an interest for it. I remember exactly the time that I developed an interest for this. I started work in Anchorage September 1st, 1982. And when I was off, uh, the first weekend I was off, I drove into a gas station and I said, which road would you recommend to go to Denali? And the guy looked at me and said, honey, the only road. <laughs> and I went to Denali and I heard a talk given by a ranger there and he had a whole lot of little vials of scat. And I experienced a very bad case of scat envy. I've always liked collecting stuff and I wanted all those vials and I, I was very envious of this gentleman. It wasn't until years later, 30 years later, that I looked at the acorn naturalist, and I knew in my heart that I've always wanted a collection of scat and those little vials. That desire has never gone away. And, and so I don't really like to shop, but uh, mostly when I, I do most of my shopping at Christmas time because that's when I go into stores and look at, cal cal uh, look at uh, catalogs for other, in order to other people. And I usually order most of my stuff that I'm going to order in the year for myself. And so I called up Acorn Naturalist and I said, I want G47932. And he goes, Wolverine scat. And I want G47559. And I went down this huge list of stuff. And the guy on the other end sort of went, oh, okay, okay, okay. And then I said, I never get the shit I want for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> he sort of laughed. But these scat replicas I've got, and I'm very happy to be the owner of them, and I've also collected a lot of little vials of scat. So I now have my own little collection. And people know what to buy me for Christmas. When I went to Africa, a friend gave me this book, and I also know what to buy other people. Four of us walked across England, and I bought all of my hiking companions a scat scarf. Uh, and I don't want you to end this talk with a lot of envy, and you can actually go online and order a bucket of poop, and it comes uh, with all these little collections. But what did your parents teach you about poop? It might have been a lot of things, but it could have included wash your hands afterwards, don't touch it, don't play with it, do it, but don't avoid it, and for whatever you do, do not mention it in polite company. <laughs> there are more acceptable names for this, and including feces, scat, poop, manure, droppings, stool, turd, whitewash, slice, crap, and dung, but don't use the S four-letter word. There are more specific names by who does it. Frass is the uh, feces of insects. Oh, I hear some groans, sorry. Sprayed is the feces of otter. And guano is a native Peruvian word for the feces of seabirds, bats, and seals. What is poop composed of? Poop com is composed of a variety of things, including millions of bacteria. We are part of a microbiome. I water, the bilirubin that's recycled from our liver, from red blood cells, intestinal mucus, fiber, unabsorbed food intake, and undigestible material. 
There are a lot of descriptors of how you describe scat. I'm going to start with size and amount. What, poop, boots, what animal poops the most in a day? An African elephant has two to, five, uh, two to five pounds per defecation and 100 defecations per day, enough to fill the trunk of your family car. It can be a real problem at the zoo. As a general rule, herbivores like elephants shit more than carnivores because they eat more. A large bull elephant can eat up to 650 pounds of vegetation in a day and poops out about a third of it. Herbivores or plant eaters have an intestine that's roughly 25 times the length of its body. Carnivores or meat eagle eaters, because the food is already processed, have a much shorter intestine, usually five to six times the length of their body. What animal has the longest intestine? It breaks the rule that I just gave you. Elephant seals have the longest intestine, two times the length of a football field or 200 yards. They're carnivores, they can eat uh, squid, fish, sharks, and rays. But for some reason, they have this very long intestine. The size of the element doesn't always correlate with the size of the crap. Uh, uh, for example, a huge giraffe has very small pillows. And what's the smallest poo in the world? Smallest poo in the world is zooplankton plankton poo, which is that many parts of an inch. And uh, they're small, but there's a lot of them. So it can be maybe really important because when, when poo sinks to the bottom of the ocean, it carries carbon with it. And, uh, and, and this, because there's a lot of poo out there in the deep ocean, it's taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And so this poo may be actually lessening global warming. <laughs> Let's go on to shape, since you've had so much fun with size. Uh, pooping a brick is not just an expression anymore. Which animal poops a brick or square? And is a wombat. And they do it, they, it's thought because it doesn't roll off. If they want to mark territory, a square poop just sits there. We were in Tasmania hiking, and you see these square things right on top of their territorial marking. What animal is in Annie's crawl space? Annie's here, and uh, Annie, Annie knows I have an interest in scat, and so she called me up and she said, I found this scat in my crawl space. What is it? Well, tips are how to figure out who done it. Uh, and uh, you can measure the individual units, analyze the contents, take a little toothpick or something and sort of go through it. You can observe the location. You can draw a short list of possible animals. You have to know what animals are in your area. And then you collect it, maybe in plastic uh, gloves and in a bag, and you check reference books. And I put a little key in your handout, and uh, it's pretty simple. And so it's basically by shape. What shape is it? Is it a sphere? If it's really a circle, it's sort of from a hair, maybe. Or is it pretty much cylindrical? OK, so you're going on the scat key. And if it's round, um, um, and there's different kinds of these spheres, these ones are really round, which is like a hair. But they're going to be sort of elongated wrong, long ones. If you go back, then there can be small ones and large ones of elongated, of which moose is one. And uh, so this question of is it more or less round, round are usually herbivores. If it's really round, think hair. If it's sort of an elongated round, think squirrel. And if it's a large elongated round, it's usually a moose, beaver, or porcupine. OK, let's go to the left side. Let's go to cylinders. Isn't this fascinating? <laughs> OK, cylinders come in a whole variety of shapes, too. There can be pointed ones, broken ones, twisted ones, and blunt ones. Uh, uh, pointed uh, cylinders usually come from the dog or canid family, so it's usually uh, like a coyote or fox. Um, and so twisted cylinders are usually from the weasel family or the mustelids, uh, and they oftentimes, because they are carnivores, have hair or bones in them, so again, checking the content can be important. They can be, if it's blunt, you can more often, it's more likely a raccoon, we don't have raccoons here, or bears. So what an animal is in Annie's crawl space? It's a twisted cylinder. It's a weasel. Then I measured it, and I used this book, which is the really best book if you really want to do this type of thing, and, uh, and to measure these things, you have to get a little caliper and stuff like that. And it's black, which suggests that it's a carnivore. Uh, and I looked at that book, and I think Annie's crawl space animal was an ermine. <laughs> the shape uh, may not always be the same for the same animal. If you think of your own scat, it's not the same day in and day out. It, it depends on a variety of things, which I won't go into. But a moose that browses on sticks in winter is very different than the same moose that grazes on plants in summer. 
when you change the diet, the bacterial readjudgment of the gut. Um, and so a lot of people will look at the thing on the left and say, oh, that's bear. And it's actually moose uh, scat that has been eaten in the summer. Um, uh, the shape, uh, is it a pellet or is it pellets are in a pile? And it depends on how long it's been in the body and moisture reabsorption. Pellets are usually drier, so it's more likely to see it, like for example, in winter if they don't stick together. Okay, uh, so um, that's the shape of mammal scat. But if you're, if you're not really fascinated, then you really get into it and you start looking at the scat of other animals. And so let's look at bird scat. Uh, well, the scat is sort of three-dimensional, but bird guano is, has a tendency to be flatter. But can you actually tell from looking at bird guano what bird did it? The answer is yes. Uh, and there are two different guidebooks uh, that you can get. Uh, what bird did that? I got this for my 50th, uh, 50th birthday from a friend that knew I was interested in this topic. And, uh, and because bird, bird, bird has only one hole, and so the urine and the poop come out the same hole. The white that's in bird uh, dew is actually uh, the urine. It's actually uric acid that's come out from the kidney. The black in bird scat is actually uh, coming out from the GI tract. You may wonder why I have this picture. <laughs> in ancient Greeks believed that uh, dejecta striking a, uh, a couple, a, a couple to be married, was sort of partitious. And, uh, and then if it struck both of them at the same time, it was particularly a good sign. Indeed, this sign was as doubly significant when the dark solids within the splay fell on the male and the white watery parts hit the female. Remnants of this belief are still echoed today in the forms of wedding attire where the green gr groom usually wears black and the bride wears white. <laughs> Describing bird feces, we can really get into this if you want to do it. Uh, so splay, and so you can start naming the topography of the different bird scat. And these splay shapes vary. Uh, so you can have a sclop, which is a small splay. You can have a splurzer, which is large with multiple extended lobes and detached lobes. You can have a splute, which is typified by a single extended lobe. Or you can have a splurred, which is a large envelope or a splutz, which has multiple extended lobes. And if you're, uh, my favorite bird is the black-capped chickadee, and it has a, it's a tight little splitzer that rewards the collector with sunbursting, even at low drop heights. A robin scat is an extended sclop with the attractive cloud-like appearance. Transition question. Okay, so a bird has one hole, the cloacae and the urine and feces what about one hole to eat and excrete through? Name an animal that does both through one hole. Very good, yeah, it's, it's, it's basically a starfish, jellyfish, well then, it's that kind of, uh, usually, that is a floater, okay? Okay, so now we've pretty well conquered the shape thing, let's move on to color. Uh, so color depends on you, you are what you eat. Uh, and so if you see white scat, it's oftentimes an animal that is eating bones, for example, like a hyena, uh, pink uh, scat, you can tell your penguin in Antarctica is eating krill. Red, if I eat beets, I'm always afraid I'm having GI bleeding every time I eat beets. I go, no, it's beets. Uh, brown is uh, red blood cells that are broken down in the liver to bilirubin or a wood eater. For example, that moose that was browsing in winter is a brown scat. Black is usually from a grass eater. Remember that moose in winter or moose in summer where that scat is black? It's usually from grass or digested blood. Green, if you eat algae or green grass. Gray for penguin eating fish, and yellow for eating squid. And so remember that uh, difference in eating, difference in color. Uh, but moose is also, I am, I am a Native Plant Society member, so I have to like, and it's impossible to not mention plants, that there are certain plants that really prefer certain scat. And you do the same thing, you go to the store and you get fertilizer that has a certain uh, you know, nitrogen content. Well, these plants know what they like too. And this particular fungus really likes moose scat. Uh, it's, it's kind of its scat of preference. So let's move on to visible content. <clears throat> seeds that pass through are actually improved. The seeds that go through a black bear grow better than seeds that are not consumed. Chemicals within the bear intestine allows the seed to soak up water and oxygen. The visible content might include berries, it might include hair if it's a carnivore, or it might include wood, if I ate wood. 
But we can't talk about food without talking about digestion. And so the visible parts of food, of, of scat, depend on the food you take in, how it's digested, what it's broken down and absorbed, and what you poop out. Maybe because you couldn't digest it, or maybe it was food, but it went through so fast, like maybe you had diarrhea, that there wasn't any time for the intestine to absorb it. Okay, so poop is, is uh, again, I'm going to talk about sort of that unabsorbed food intake, for example, diarrhea or hairs, or undigestible material that you can't digest it at all. For example, if I ate wood. <clears throat> so what would happen if I, ate, if I browsed on sticks all winter? Well, some animals are better at digesting than others due to different digestive systems. Humans and pigs were a monogastric digestive system. We have one stomach, and the stomach has a very low pH or acid, and it helps us to digest our protein. But monogastric animals require high-quality food, like amylose carbohydrates. We have the enzymes amylase to break down the chains of glucoses that make up amylose. What is amylose? It's basically starch or carbohydrates, chains of glucose. Each one of those little units is a glucose, and the whole group together are called amylose, and that's the main kind of starch that we eat or carbohydrates that mono, monogastric animals can consume. But there are other forms of glucose or polysaccharides where the glucose is linking in a chain. And what is the most abundant polysaccharide on the planet? Lignin was a great guess. It's cellulose is the most abundant polysaccharide or chain of sugar on the planet. It's a supporting part of plants, stems, flowers, wood, and trees. Lignin is what is in cell walls of plants that make them stiff and allows plants to grow tall in evolution. Both amylose and cellulose are chains of glucose. So why can't I eat cellulose? Why can't I digest wood? That's glucose. It's really simple. There's a flat little dimension. So let's look at this. But it turns out that glucoses can vary. This one has the, that uh, OH group both on the bottom. And the beta glucoses have one on the bottom, one on the top. So what's the difference? OK. So starch, the thing that we consume, has the, the, has the hydroxyl groups all on the bottom. Cellulose varies every other one. Uh, and so that's what varies. That's how cellulose varies from amylose. And so this is the most pr uh, common uh, chain of glucoses on the planet, and we can't consume it, but we can't consume that. You sort of wonder in evolution if plants sort of figure out, hey, man, all we have to do is flip these hydroxyl groups, and they can't eat us, and I can, we can still grow really tall and outcompete the other plants. I, I made that up. But you have to wonder in evolution of, of chemistry why that happened and what the, what the impact has been on the planet. So monogastric organisms can't eat wood. We can't break down the bonds that combine the glucoses in a chain because we don't have the enzyme cellulases. Cellulase is not one enzyme. There's a whole bunch of different enzymes that can break down the, the uh, glucose chains of it. Ruminants are animals that can digest cellulose. There are 150 species. 90% of all the mammals in Eurasia and Africa are ruminants. There's 95 million wild ruminants and 3.5 domestic ruminants. What's, how does it vary? Well, we have a mono, we're a monogastric organism. We have one stomach. Ruminants have four different stomachs. So they eat, and they chew for a while, and then they burp, and they, they burp their cud back up, and they chew a little bit more, and then they drop it back down, they chew it in all these stomachs, and it's going back and forth, back and forth, and they keep eating their little grass. So a simple stomach is pretty similar. Uh, we have a stomach with a lot of acid in it, hydrochloric acid that consumes our proteins, and then it goes into the intestine. What the root that animal does is it adds another chamber that it goes into, this four-part stomach. And what's in the four-part stomach? Microbes. What actually does the digestion of cellulose in the ruminant digestive system? And what it is, is it's, it's a whole uh, microbiome of organisms inside the ruminant stomach that actually does the digestion. So it's bacteria, protozoa, fungi, yeast in the ruminant tracts. And that's the, actually the organism that has the cellulases to break down cellulose. Uh, and, uh, and so some organisms can do that. Um, and but mono, mono organ, uh, the the sorry the the ruminant has these microbes in this four part stomach, so it can break the chains apart. We because we have a very low acid, we don't have many microorganisms in our stomach, and so we don't have the organisms that have the cellulase that can break cellulose down. 
For Sheila, it wasn't enough to just be a vegetarian. That's why she became a ruminant. <laughs> Is Sheila making a good decision? The advantages of being a ruminant is that you can eat the most abundant chain of sugar on the planet and it's all around you almost everywhere. The disadvantage of being a ruminant is you have to eat a really large amount of less nutritious food and you have to be constantly moving or grazing. What's the advantage of being a monogastric? We don't have to eat so much because we're eating a much higher nutrient food content. The disadvantage of being a mono, uh, monogastric? We would starve if the only option was to eat cellulose as we don't have the microorganisms in our GI system to make this most prevalent chain of sugar available to us. What would happen if I browsed on six all winter? You guessed it, it would appear in my feces as an undigestible. So my poop, if I ate wood, I'd have this undigestible material wood that would come out the other end because I don't have the cellulases. But the GI microorganisms are important in digestion in many animals. Let's look at two specific examples. This is a lot of material, isn't it? I need you to many Okay, let's look at two specific examples. Let's look at pandas. It's usually herbivores have very long intestines. I told you that. But pandas have really short intestines. So how do they digest uh, bamboo? Well, they've now done analysis of 5,500 gene sequences from panda scat and compared with sequences from guts of other herbivores. Uh, they've ID'd 85 taxonomy distinct entities. 13 of these are closely related to the genus Clostridium, which includes bacteria known to digest cellulose. Seven of these organisms are only found in pandas. So something about panda evolution has allowed it to have a certain microorganism that allows it to digest with a very short stomach a food product that doesn't have much nutrition in it, namely bamboo. What organism can eat wood? Termites. But is it really the termites that do the eating? Nope, it's the microorganisms. And so it, it also is a, microorganism, a, a microbial endosymbiotics. It has a community of anaerobic protozoans and bacteria in the uh, GI gut of the termite that actually does the eating. Eating cellulose, wood, uh, termites, and their uh, microambients, there are actually higher evolved termites that actually have their own cellulases. But being lazy, they sort of say, nah, we got this stuff, we'll let them do it. So even though they could, some of the higher evolved will still have a microbial uh, content in their stomach that where the, those microorganisms do the digestion of the cellulose. Okay, so digestion 101, I hope you all got this all. I know it's kind of, but, uh, but there's two important types of polysaccharide chains of sugar. There's amylose or starch, which is a type of glucose that we eat. Monogastrics have this amylase enzyme and can digest it. The other uh, chain of sugar, cellulose, the most abundant chain on the planet, microorganisms have the cellulases to break down them into individual glucose units. And it's the actual the microorganisms in these stomachs of the ruminants and termites and pandas that actually do the digestion of the wood or bamboo. Monogastrics, like ourselves, have the enzyme to break down amylose, but we don't have microorganisms to make cellulases in our GI tract to break down. We can't eat wood. So it would appear as a digestible. Okay, so let's uh, digestion transition quizzes question. Uh, what animal has the most acidic digestive system? A crocodile can digest all parts of the prey animal, and the scat is often white because it's digested bones. Why does acidity matter? Uh, the scat also has a low acid, so it, it takes paint off your paddle, but it also takes the paint off your car. So if you have bird scat on your car, you should wash it off because the acidity in the bird guano will affect your car. Decisions, decisions. When and where? Where to poop? Anywhere versus choose a spot. On top of the ground or bury it? Do you want others to smell it or not? <laughs> Anywhere. A cow, right after it eats, I, I come from a long line of dairy farmers. My father's a large animal veterinarian. And uh, this is a gutters in a barn. And when you, you have your cows come in to milk them, and you feed your cows, and they instantly crap into these gutters. And then you have these conveyor belts that move the uh, cow excrement, and you dump it into your manure spreader, and then you spread the manure onto your crops. Uh, and the cow just does it anywhere. And uh, it's a gastrocolic reflex. Uh, but, let's do what, but some animals don't do it just anywhere. They'll, they pick a latrine, the same place to do it over and over. Raccoons, foxes, meerkats, otters, get the right answer, chinchillas. Badgers dig a pit, 
rhinos use the same place so they can walk through it and spread it on their feet. My, large, my father was a large animal veterinarian. He told me that pigs are naturally housebroken. If you keep a sty clean, the, the pig will go outside to, to, to take a crab. You always think of pigs as being sort of, you know, dirty animals, but they're actually, uh, they're, you know, they naturally have a latrine, natural. Uh, Marmot Midden, this is one that I took on the uh, John Muir Trail. And uh, why have a latrine? Well, it can't be territorial marking. Urine and fecal deposits are to the animal what business cards are to a coat and tie people. They tell you the basic facts, male, female, profession, workplace, and what you ate at your last meal. Cats and dogs uh, release a fluid from their anal glands to add to the poo. Dogs and cats sniff each other's anus as a greeting and to gather information. Hyenas poop along a border of a territory. Why not spread the smell around? Rhinos walk through it to spread it. But they also, the hippos have a, t and so when they go to the bathroom, I saw this in, in Botswana, and uh, so as it's going, it, 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 twirls, it twirls its tail around as it's taking a crap, and the, and the stuff just goes everywhere. And uh, so the, it's called muck spreading, and it's believed that it's a territorial marking. Um, okay, predator rolling in poo. And so you want to smell like what you're hunting. Uh, and uh, this is uh, products out of the Cabela's catalog. So you yourself, if you want to order this stuff, can smell like a deer. And so if you're hunting a deer, you may want to smell like a deer. So likewise, animals uh, that are potentially rolling in, in the prey's poo may be trying to smell like the prey. Uh, so do it. Problem? I just rolled in it. Why do dogs roll in other dogs' poo? Now, you know, you take your dog, you get them cleaned, and immediately they go out and roll, right? So one theory is, again, this is from Cabela's catalog, so you can buy coon urine, fox urine, or boar urine to spray on yourself. I don't know what your friends there or your family thinks about it, but, but one theory is that predators roll in prey poo so that the prey won't smell you coming. The other theory is that it tells the pack about a food source that's around. Gee, Al smells like deer feces. There must be deer around to eat. And uh, that's the other kind of theory about it. So this is the perfume counter in the doggy department. Good morning, madam. Would you like to try some cow fat in Paris? Hello, ladies. Anyway, you got the idea. <clears throat> so, but why have a latrine? Well, territorial marking. But what about self-protection? It keeps all the harmful parasites and bacteria in one place. And it also keeps the smell in one place. Why does smell, why does poop smell? You've always wondered this. It contains bacteria, and some of the bacteria produce an organic compound, and these are volatile, and it produces high amounts of noxious gases like nitrogen and sulfur. High fiber diets of most herbivores produce less noxious poop than carnivores. I once went to a yoga cl uh, clinic, and everyone was a vegetarian, and I noticed that the bathroom smelled really different than the usual bathroom. <laughs> and. <laughs> uh, but getting rid of the smell can be important. Hunters know this, so you've got to get rid of your own smell. So this is scent color. You can get this from Cabela's. And, uh, and, it, and, but also, animals sometimes want to get rid of the smell. So when the, when the baby bird poops inside the nest, it poops inside a gelatin kind of capsule. And so the feces is actually can, is, is a little can, and the adult then carries the poop away from the nest so that any predator birds won't smell that there's young, uh, young birds in there. I'm sure you guys can see very well, sorry. Um, <clears throat> where do most primates poop? Underneath their bedroom. And I would argue that most of you probably poop pretty close to your bedroom. <laughs> when? Bird photographers know that the time to photograph a bird, that they're going to, right before they fly, is when they lighten their load. When? A sloth comes down once a week. Uh, it climbs down a tree, risking predation. It's a very slow moving animal, that's why they call it a sloth, right? And so why, why do they do that once a week? There's lots of theories. Some say it's to fertilize the trees. Some say it's the sound of the pellets dropping from a height would attract predators. Some say that the ancestors lived on the ground and so they inherited the behavior of wanting to be a ground uh, uh, going to the bathroom. Is it a territorial marking? Or does it serve for benefits for parasites that live in the fur? So lots of theories, but nobody really knows why the sloth comes down once a week and threatens predation by doing it. When? Uh, what about when to do it? Well, not to poop in winter. If you're obviously a bear and you're sleeping and you're pooping all the time, uh, your predators and other things are going to smell you. 
so you don't really want to poop. And actually, bears eat indigestibles. They eat pine needles, leaves, their own hair to plug up the hole. Um, and so they sort of know. And I, I don't know, when I go winter camping, I never wanted to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, go and have a, a bowel movement. And so I would eat cheese. And so it would give me calories. And, you know, so it's sort of the same thing, I think. Uh, anyway, you get the idea. There's a reason for where and when. Okay, but let's beyond attracting a mate and declaring territory. They asked uh, GPS Haldane, uh, you know, what he, what he had learned in his life of being a biologist about evolution on the planet. Yeah, he was an atheist, and he, and he kind of cryptically said back to the journalist, God must have had an order, ordinate fondness for beetles. Beetles and an ordinate fondness. A quarter of all living species are beetles, half of all insects. There are 250,000 species of plants on the planet, 4,000 mammals, 350,000 species of beetles on the planet. So what in evolutionary history has permitted the, uh, the beetles such a, such diversification? How have they gone to so many different things? And it's mostly their ability to switch diets. We know that the polar bear may be going extinct because it has a very limited diet. And if seals go away, polar bears are going away. So having a diverse diet interest is a good way to sort of live, right? And the ability to switch plants. So you got to make a living. you got to find a unique niche. There's a lot of it. Why not specialize in poop? These are the dung beetles of Madagascar. <laughs> dung beetles, they courtship with frass. There are 17,000 kinds of dung beetles. They're attracted to scat by its smell. And there are different kinds of dung beetles, but the rollers, the male rolls the scat into a ball, attracting the female by its size. The largest poo ball is the most attractive to the female. Yes. Size matters. <laughs> they then proceed to roll the ball into a hole, and they, they dive into the, the scat ball, and they eat. Uh, they eat as they go. It's sort of a honeymoon boudoir. And then the eggs are laid in the ball, and when the babies are born, the grubs eat the ball. It's sort of like a little nursery. So it's a good deal. And they do this at night. Uh, and it is the strongest insect in the world. It can move about 1,141 times its own weight. And they not only strong, but they have to move really fast because there's a lot of competition with the other beetles to get this thing in the hole. So they've now figured out how does the, the dung beetle get the thing to the hole the fastest? They blindfolded, I kid you not, I read this two different places. They blindfolded the dung beetles and they found that they navigate by the Milky Way. I'll show you the reference. <laughs> Okay, so using, okay, eating shit, coprophagia, comes from a Greek word, for copros means feces and phasia means eat. And there are lots of choices. You could eat your other's feces, you could eat your own, or you could feed yours to your young. <laughs> Motherly love, eating your child's poop. Mother deer, or, or for the fawns the first month, the fawn is actually lying in the grass, is at very high risk for predation from predators. So what the mother does is it licks the anus of the fawn and stimulates defecation. And then it eats, it eats the, uh, the excrement of its young so that the predators can't find their fawn. So that's what I call motherly love. How do you keep the pouch clean? A kangaroo, the young joey, poos in the pouch for the first year. The mother licks the anus to stimulate defecation and avoid constipation uh, because the joey is inactive. And then the mother eats it. Who eats what? Feeding your young their poo. Koala bear parents feed their young their poo so that they can change from a diet of milk to a plant diet. Bacteria helps to digest the eucalyptus. Uh, the poo is also high in protein and vitamin K and minerals. There are a lot of animals that eat their parents' shit. Pandas, rhinos, termites, elephants, horses, some uh, lizards and turtles. And the function is thought that it colonizes their own intestine with useful bacteria and nutrients. We talked about the importance of having microorganisms in your gut for digestion. So eating your parents shit isn't too crazy. I have a midwife friend. And a lot of babies we know are now born cesarean rather than vaginally. If you Google microbirth, they're now taking the vaginal secretions of the mother in cesarean birth and smearing it into the mouth of the newborn in order to colonize the baby born by cesarean, because perhaps coming through your vaginal uh, canal helps you to seed helpful bacteria. 
And there's now some evidence that your immunity is better and some other things. But of course, when the woman is pushing, she's pushing a, you know, probably the push of her life and is pushing out a lot of things come out, babies, but also urine and also uh, excrement. So you wonder what kind of colonization is really going on uh, that maybe not just vaginal. So if you look, uh, it, you, can, I, you can Google this. Uh, it's called microbirth and the importance of colonization of the newborn. Vaginal birth exposes the child to mother's microbiome. In mouse studies published in the Journal of Immunology, you can prevent autoimmune diseases such as type 1 diabetes, Crohn's disease, allergies. So this whole sort of thing about the importance of microorganisms and we are part of a microbiome. Uh, eating others' foods, because it could be the best nutrition available. Ants eat bird droppings, rats and mice eat dog feces, jackals, spotted hyenas, and hooded uh, vultures eat uh, uh, lion dung, and uh, so on. What about eating your own? I would call that the ultimate locavore. <laughs> eat your own. Gorillas and some primates and hares. Why do hares eat their own feces? Hares have two types of fecal matter. They have pellets, which is uh, sort of these round things that we talked about. They also have something called cecotropes, which is small, moist mucus that never hits the ground, so you've probably never seen it. And we've already talked about there's two kinds of GI tracts, the monogastric that we have, the four-part stomach that ruminants have, but there's even another way to digest. And it's, these are hindgut fermenters, and their microorganisms sit in an enlarged cecum and in large intestine, and that's where the digestion is done. Again, it's microorganisms, but they're in a different location. And so the food rapidly transits through the stomach and small intestine into the cecum. Um, and these cecotropes, these night feces, they rarely find, as the hair eats them, they're a central part of their diet. They have vital nutrients, beneficial bacteria, they're high in vitamins. And if you deprive uh, hairs from eating these night feces, they die. They're produced in the hindgut by fermentation that passes quickly through the esophagus. They're called cecotropes or night feces. What's the advantage of being a hindgut fermenter? The food that went through too fast to be digested gets re-eaten through coprophagia, so you don't miss out on the nutrients. You eat scat, and it allows restoration of your gut flora. So you, you shred out bacteria, but you get to re-eat the bacteria and get your microflora back up. The advantages of being also they're bulky feeders. They eat large quantities of low-nutrient food all day long and survive on conditions where ruminants might not be able to obtain nutrition adequate to their needs on this low-nutrient food and uh, they process more rapidly than monogastrids, uh, and then they don't have to reach you their cud. So there is some advantage in doing this. What's the disadvantage of being a hind fermenter? They have to eat all day long, and if they don't, they'll starve. So hair feces is composed of millions of bacteria. They re-eat it, they recolonize. The pellets are the, the stuff that you see in hairs that, that has wood in it, and it's the cecotrophs you've never seen. It's unabsorbed food intake that's re-eaten through coprophagia. Another reason to eat scat is vultures. They get pigments, pigments from the uh, keratins, and it turns out that if you're yellow like this, you're more attractive to sexual partners. So eating scat gives you this uh, color. What about ants and aphid foo? You attract others to eat your frass. It's an evolutionary adaptation. Aphid poop uh, has, is a sugary syrup called honeydew. The ants come to eat the aphid poop. And then the ants stayed, and they protect the aphids from having wasps. It's a symbiotic relationship when the whole thing is driven by aphid poo. What about uh, this? Uh, a penguin nest. And uh, it basically keeps the young in and others out. And it may be an, actually an insect repellent to keep the insects away. You can also distract your predator. If you're a butterfly uh, versus a wasp, or you're a skipper butterfly, and uh, you shoot poo far away. So if somebody's flying after you, but you're a butterfly, you shoot the poop, and your predator goes after the poop and lets you go. That's basically how that works. What about these things? These things could bite or squeeze you, but uh, they also use defensive sprays. So they spray poop to distract their predators, alligator, lizards, cottonmouth snake, and anaconda. I mean, if an anaconda sprayed any kind of scat near me, I would be so out of there. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, what about protecting the young in the nest? Arctic terns spray species, again, on nest intruders, so keep others out. 
blue boobies don't recognize their young if they go outside the guano ring. So the guano ring keeps, they only feed the chicks that are inside that ring. Where should I lay my eggs? You protect your nest. If you're a millipede and you make a nest in feces, you cover the eggs with more feces against uh, things that might eat your, uh, eat, eat. or if you're a dung fly, you lay your eggs in the cow patties. Nobody else can find it. You can also use it to protect yourself. You can hide under layers of feces, eat the feces, and the feces repels your predators. What about this? The devil corsair eggs look like elephant, or look like antelope poop. And so what the devil corsair does is it lays its eggs in the antelope poop so that the, the thing that's trying to eat the eggs doesn't find it because it's camouflaged by the antelope poo. You can look like poop and attract insects to eat. Crab spiders look like bird droppings. The butterfly comes to get the salt and water from what looks like poop and bang, the spider eats them. Or you can look like poop mimicry. The dung uh, spider birds uh, use eyesight, but they can't find uh, this because it, it looks like it's dung, and so they just kind of ignore it. What's the tallest structure made of poop? Again, it's the, it is a, a made, of, made of poop. Uh, it, and again, it's this, excuse me. As you, again, it's a symbiotic relationship between termites and these microorganisms. The termites uh, use, use their own scat to build homes, uh, and it, but they also produce 11% of greenhouse gases. These things can be 29 feet tall. A termite mound is made out of uh, termite feces, termite saliva, charcoal, mud, and wood. What about this bird? We saw this bird, a secretary bird in uh, Botswana, beautiful bird that kind of walks, a very huge bird. And it builds its nest out of sticks, animal fur, and zebra dung. What about a Peruvian booby? Makes his entire nest out of guano. Uh, let's say you're in a really hot environment, and you want to cool off, you squirt your legs, and the liquid has an evaporative effect, and so it cools the legs out of storks. You can also play possum, and you can prove the predator by defecating green poo on yourself, and it tur turns off your predator. I think that would work for me. Uh, <clears throat> and then you, you can use a protection or germicide. A vulture poop, uh, they poop on themselves, and it's thought that they kill germs and bacteria. You can imagine if you're a bacteria and eating all this dead meat all the time. There's a lot of stuff crawling around in their maggots and you know, the, all that. And so, but a poop, uh, the poop of the vulture, they shit on themselves, and it kills the germs and bacteria the chemicals in the excrement. So a summary, you know, I, I listed them for you on that thing. There are a lot of uses of animals. But what about us? This is a moss on scat. Humans use animal poop too. <laughs> okay, Xanthoria elegans. Okay, it's a uh, lichen. And if you're a bird biologist and you want to spot a raptor nest, what you do is you, you scope and you look for that or orange. And right below the raptor nest, the bird has been pooping, and so that lichen grows. If you're a spot, spot you know, falcons, that's how you can do it. The, uh, the uh, this, uh, Xanthoria elegans likes the nitrogen in the bird scat. How about if you're trying to look for confiscated elephant tusks and rhino horns, okay? They can now do DNA from the animal scat uh, that has been used to ID poachers, so they can figure out where these elephants came from by analyzing their poop, and then they can do extra watching in that area because these are where those elephants that are confiscated are coming from. So by analyzing the poop, you can help. What about the tail of the whale? So let's say you're trying to find some orca whale poop. Uh, it looks like pancake batter, and it only floats for about 30 seconds to 45 minutes, and you've got to find it fast. But if you do, you can measure the nutritional and stress hormones, and you can tell if they're pregnant. And if you're like in, you know, about a Seattle, they have identified all these orcas, right? They know this, the white and black patterns. Of, they know them like they got names. And so, but how do you find the scat before it sinks? Conservation Canines, it's a nonprofit organization founded in 1997. And what they do is they, they, they go to dogs from shelters and rescue centers that possess, in quotes, a drive to play which is unmatched in its intensity, typically ill-suited for the average home. They required structured play for long periods of time and otherwise develop destructive and neurotic behavior. I have one of these dogs. Um, <laughs> And, but conservation canines, and so what they do, these dogs will do anything if you throw the ball for them. So they will teach the dog 
what the smell of, El, of, of orca poo is. They am on the boat, the dog goes, orca poo, orca poo, arf, arf. and then they throw the ball for him, and then that's the payment. Uh, it was this anywhere else. It's done in, actually in Denali, and this is where I first heard about it. Let's say you're trying to look at the interaction between canids, and you're trying to find poop of maybe coyotes, wolves, foxes. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, coyotes, uh, wolves, and foxes. Uh, and so you basically have scat trails. So they're taking now dogs into Denali Park. The dogs can find the scat. And you can do genetic analysis off the scat and tell the population size and trends in the population. You can also determine their diet. Uh, there are a number of groups doing this. Uh, U.S. Uh, Forest Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Nature Conservancy, a lot of these conservation canine animals are being used. What about canines to smell colon cancer? Uh, they, are, they are now looking at dogs, and I thought this was sort of a joke, but, uh, 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 but anyway, uh, but it's, uh, but it, uh, it, let's say people that are exposed to asbestos, uh, a certain percent of those people are going to go on to a cancer called mesothelioma that Steve McQueen died from. They can now do gas chromatography and do exhalations of people exposed to asbestos and figure out the person that's going to get the mesothelioma. So there's something about the volatile ex uh, stuff that the person is breathing out that will help them identify. Well, the same thing is sort of going on here. These cancers produce volatile chemicals, and dogs have the capability of smelling that chemical and perhaps can identify who uh, might have colon cancer. Uh, and there's debate about this. When you go online, you know, so there's some cities and people put it down. It's, it's sort of an interesting area. Okay, what about a zoo? And you, you want to breed giraffes. And you have a zoo, you've got a male, and you've got two female giraffes. But the male, it shows absolutely no interest in reproducing. What do you do? You bring in the poo of a second male, and bang. That first male, he's got interest in those females, and you have got yourselves baby giraffes. What about rhinoceros relocation programs, okay? Well, it's really stressful. You take the rhinoceros to a new area and the animal's out of its home territory. How do you make them feel at home? You bring in feces from their original territory to the new territory, and when you do stress hormone levels in rhinoceros, I don't want to be the one to draw the lab, uh, but it shows that the animal's much less stressed. So again, moving their poo, this is, this is what home smells like, the poo smells like home. You move it to the new territory, oh boy, it smells like home, I like it here. What about getting rid of beavers? Okay, I like beavers, but not everyone does it. Sometimes they're sort of a hassle, right? So how do you get rid of beavers? You bring in other beaver dungs, and they think, ooh, we got competition, they move to a new habitat. Okay, what about which person in your neighborhood is not picking up the dog poo? And you know, or the one that leaves the bag. You know, they put it in the bag, then they leave it there, and you sort of don't like that anymore. Okay, you can take the poo, and you can do DNA testing on it, and you can identify the dog, and hence you can identify the owner that is not picking up their dog poo. <laughs> DNA profiling. Okay, what about you're trying to figure out what did Tyrannosaurus rex eat? You can get fossilized poop or coprolites. Coprolites, and you could do DNA analysis on poop. When you find these things, you're, you're really happy, I guess. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, and they figured out that he was eating a smaller dinosaur. But, you know, but coprolites happen, these uh, fossilized poop. Okay? What did the extinct Shasta ground sloth eat? Okay, again, you can find these fossilized things, coprolites. They've been extinct in North America for 11,000 years, but you can get the feces and do DNA sequencing, and you can figure out what plants they had. What about hyenas? You can get 2,000-year-old uh, fossilized scat. You can tell what they eat, and if you can tell what they eat, you then know what plants grew, and you can guess what the climate was when those plants grew. So again, using fossilized excrement. What if you're an entomologist and you want to score and you want to find new species, you know, get the article written in the journal? You look at oh, this, you know, poop. And uh, this guy's a guy decided to work at wombat poop. He found 24 new fly species. Okay, what about using it for building? We talked about uh, that uh, termites build the longest, uh, highest uh, structure. Well, there are a lot of humans in the world that use cow dung patties. It's very sticky. And so people in Tanzania use it to, to build their homes. Uh, they, now, they have found that llama poo absorbs tin and silver in water from old mining sites. So it's being used as a very low uh, cost to purify 
purify water. What about fences for poo bricks, uh, fencing in your yak? Okay, so you can kind of get this stuff and you use the yak and then you make a fence and keep your yak in, sort of low, low cost fencing. What about fecal transplants? We're part of a microbiome. Um, and so there's now a very bad disease called Clostridia difficile and people get lots and lots of antibiotics and you wipe out their normal flora and then they get this infection called Clostridia difficile and it is, can be fatal. Uh, it can perforate the intestine and people get back in the hospital over and over. It's a terrible problem. The, dis the medicine is used to treat it. Vancomycin causes uh, kidney toxicity. And so this is a really big deal. So what they're doing is they're taking feces from normal people, putting it in the person that has Clostridia difficile, and successfully curing the Clostridia difficile by, by repopulating the microbiome. Uh, and I had a patient that was in her 90s. He had a terrible problem. This was done, and it worked. Uh, so I mentioned that, is, uh, and you can go to the Fecal Transplant Foundation. Uh, but fecal transplants is a procedure where you take the fecal uh, bacteria collected by a tested donor, you mix it with saline and solution, strain it, and you put it into the patient by either a colonoscopy, endoscopy, sigmoidoscopy, or an enema. Fecal transplants were first done actually in the fourth century in China. They've been used by veterinary medicine for years, but it's now being used in humans to treat Clostridia difficile. What about smoking your meat? Here in Iceland, there's not a lot of maybe uh, trees around for wood, and they actually use sheep food to smoke meat. I don't know what it tastes like. <laughs> what about tossing turds for fun? <laughs> Beaver, Oklahoma, cow chip throwing capital of the world. Every April, there is a world championship on cow chip tossing. What about the Talkeetna Moose Drop Festival? We have our own kind of thing here, right? Why collect caterpillar droppings in South America? Well, you are what you eat, and if you're eating a plant that has cocaine, you have cocaine. So uh, collecting, uh, you know, co you know kind of, uh, what to do with caterpillar droppings. What about cigarettes made out of horse poop? This is real shit horse poop, and uh, it's very mild, sweet, it's stable and blended. Stable blended, oh, that's but stable. Okay. Now this is for your tourist in China. This is panda bear. And the reason why I think that this is a foreign writer is bear shit cigarettes. This is the last discovery in cigarettes. You will never find better flavor in cigarettes. Try bear shit cigarettes and you will be pleasant of them. You can't find this kind of cigarette in any other part of the world. If you smock this cigarette, you're going to feel like another man. Because this smock is really delicious. Try it. So it's an enterprising somebody that doesn't speak English as a second language, and so I guess you go to China and buy this stuff. I don't know. Okay, but our, our, our tobacco shit, we are happy with. It really tastes good. Okay, what about the most expensive cup of coffee in the world? Now, I know you feel like you're sort of ripped off when you go to, uh, you know, uh, but anyway, but they, you basically... This, this cup of coffee costs $50 a cup. The beans of this coffee are eaten, scarred, and passed through a palm shivet, which is a, re a relative of a mongoose. And digestive enzymes remove the bitterness and increase the aroma and taste. Now, I don't know how you figured this out. You just line up a whole bunch of animals and say, okay, eat this coffee, and I will make it, and we'll sort of figure out oh, the chivet. Ah, the chivet one is the one. I don't know how you figure this out, but $50 a cup, I've, n I've not had the pleasure. What about human beverages in China? Changa is a fragrant uh, black tea mixed with the droppings of certain moths. Uh, uh, when you're charving, this is a group of uh, actually natives that I'd not heard of in that part of Texas. And when they were starving, they ate uh, deer poop. What about fertilizer? There was a guano rush in Peru in 1860. 400 shiploads were sent to the US and it was Peru's main export. Uh, and uh, it made enough money to run the country. Uh, moss on uh, penguin. This is a, a moss that grows, as, especially likes, it likes bear scat. This is Denali Park. Poo for firewood. So lots of people use poo for firewood. Uh, yak, uh, I actually keep bees, and you can use moose to light your bee smoker. Uh, there's enough wood content in uh, winter moose scat uh, to, to light your, uh, your bee smoker. Uh, but, but poo is also done in yak, dung in Nepal, cow dung, and it was actually done in prairie firewood in the United States. 
You can make paper from it because there's enough undigestible fiber in it. This is actually an Alaska product bought, uh, that, uh, that you can get this from. Okay. Okay, or if you really, the geisha facial uses the feces of nightingale birds. <laughs> Poop has its downsides, though. So. Uh, there you can be allergic to shit, and people uh, talk about it, dust mites, but it's actually the protein in the dust of the uh, mite feces, the frass that people are allergic to. And you can also be allergic to cockroach frass, the excrement of cockroaches. Uh, there's also dangers in poo. There's a lot of diseases. So if you're going to do stuff, you know, crazy stuff like this, like start collecting this stuff, you know, kind of be careful because uh, there are a lot of diseases that you can get. Uh, and Chagas disease is a disease in South America. Some people think that Charles Darwin, you know, who went to a whole lot of health, uh, you know, always going to health uh, uh, things for most of his life, and he wrote a journal every day of all the symptoms he was having. Some people think that Charles Darwin had Chagas disease. But it's, it's gotten from in South America, and it's insect frass uh, that infects with the mouth or through a bite. What are the dangers of poo? So it's important to wash your hands. So that completes my scoop on poop, my facts on feces, my tips on turds, my dad on dung, and my goods on guano. I hope you didn't think this talk was too crappy. Rather, it poop appreciation. It's a lot more than just solid waste. Well, that certainly was a lot of shit to take in. <laughs> well, we're open for a Q&A here, so if anyone has any questions. Uh, yes, sir? So if you're short on cash, uh, can you be paid to be a uh, fecal transplant donor? Uh, I know it's being done in Anchorage, and I don't know what the qualifications are for donors, <laughs> but it's, it is being done in Anchorage. He said a snail excretes on its own head. I've not heard that, but uh, that's interesting. I, I didn't run across that. Interesting. But I have no idea why. <laughs> Maybe it's spreading. You know, I mean, this excrement, this, it, you know, it has this bacteria and it has a nutrient content in a lot of scat because a lot of scat goes through and there's still nutrient benefits. And so maybe the uh, snail is re-eating or getting bacteria. would be my guess, but I don't really know. That's better than my theory. I thought it was just dependent on Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, I won't go there, I don't think. Anyway, uh, good. Well, okay, we'll see who won the uh, uh, team. I think all of us are really interested in poop, but it's sort of a topic we can't talk about. And sort of, uh, you know, it, it, it's cheap. I know people that didn't have money, and so that when they made Christmas gifts, they made it, uh, made earrings for people. But, uh, you know, it's a very novelty item. And most places in the country don't have moose. And so to bring back moose poop, it's like this very unique you know, Alaska thing. Better than an ulu. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. All right, well, thanks a lot to Beth Baker. And of course, we'd like to give her our, 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 our presenters uh, complimentary uh, gifts here. The first is always, of course, our Anchorage Science Pub uh, lager mugs. Has the uh, Anchorage Science Pub logo on the front, and of course, the molecule for ethyl alcohol on the back. <laughs> and of course, uh, the Taproot is uh, giving a complimentary uh, gift card to her as well. So there you go, Beth. Thank you very much. She will be here to answer any questions if you have a one-on-one. -on -one. There is also a fine display of poop up here if you'd like to take a look at it. Most of it is, of course, not real. 